The term cultural Marxism is one that is used heavily in modern discussions dealing with contemporary social issues as well as issues within the church. So today in our video, we're going to be explaining exactly what cultural Marxism is and what the roots of it are, as well as how we are to evaluate and understand this movement. So to begin, we must look at the foundations of what Marxism is and then discuss how it was appropriated today into what is sometimes known as cultural Marxism. Marxism begins in the 19th century with a man named Karl Marx, of course, with Frederick Engels. Now, Marx and Engels argued that both sociology and anthropology can best be understood by gaining an understanding of class systems. Now, what they argued is that there is a, an essential economic divide that happens within capitalism. And people are basically divided into two groups. There is the bourgeois and the proletariat. Now, the bourgeois are those who have the most money and they control the means of production. The proletariat are the ones who are abused or used by the bourgeois and do not really have a say in what happens within a culture. And it is argued that there is then this class struggle, the ruling class as well as those who are poorer, the working class. And this struggle for Marx outlines the basic structure and foundations of society. And for him, all of the other inequalities and issues that happen can essentially boil down to these economic ones. Now, Marx also was a follower of Hegel, a prominent philosopher in the 19th century, who argued that history is in a process, a process of change, and that history is essentially improving. Now, Marx bought into certain aspects of Hegel's philosophy while he rejected others. And so he created his own view of world history, that things were coming to a kind of conclusion, that things were going to improve. There was a kind of uh, synthesis that was going to happen between the antithesis and the thesis, as Hegel described. And for Marx, this would lead to a new form of state that we now know as communism. Marx argued that it was inevitable within the progress of history that there would be a socialist revolution. Of course, we have seen how that worked itself out with various communist countries coming into power in the 20th century. And as we have seen, the results were not all that positive. But this so far describes only Karl Marx himself in a very basic overview and probably inadequate one. But after this, the ideas of Karl Marx shifted and changed, and certain thinkers took his ideas about economics and applied them to other areas of social life. In particular, this was adopted by a school of thought sometimes described as the Frankfurt School, being named after Frankfurt, Germany, where the school was founded. Now, this term, the Frankfurt School, refers primarily to an institution called the Institute for Social Research, founded in 1923 by a number of different thinkers. And this is labeled critical theory. Now, critical theory itself is something that is very hard to define, and when you read the actual books on critical theory, even the authors themselves don't really give a clear definition because it really cannot be defined. But broadly speaking, critical theory is a theory of, supposedly, of all of reality, or at least that is the intention, which is critical. Critical, not just of capitalism, but also critical of historic Western thought and the historic Western world. And so critical theory plays itself out in all different areas of thought, including economics, but goes far beyond that to social relations as well as things like art. But what's really important about this whole movement and how it affects us today is this, that with critical theory, the ideas of Karl Marx were developed and expanded to relate to all different areas of thought. Now, while Marx thought that all different social relations were essentially and foundationally based upon economics, critical theory began applying this narrative of an oppressed group and an oppressor group and applying it to various aspects of social life. And the oppressor was no longer seen as just the rich or the bourgeois who controlled the means of production, but it was expanded to speak about issues of race, class, and gender. Classically, those are the three that are used the most, though there are many other categories that can be discussed in this way as well. And it's argued that there are those classes which are oppressors. Those people who are oppressors are those who are of the privileged class, the privileged race, as well as the privileged gender. And the oppressed are those who are the underprivileged. 
And this broader narrative is seen as a way to understand basically all of reality itself, and that's the way that this developed in the culture that we are in today. Now, this was adopted in some ways by Foucault and postmodernism. However, postmodernism actually denies the essential idea of any overarching meta narrative at all. And that would include the Marxist meta narrative. So, certain ideas from Marxism, or what is sometimes known now as cultural Marxism, were adopted by postmodernists though they do not necessarily have the kind of optimism of a social revolution as a necessity as Karl Marx himself did. Though oftentimes I think it's the case that activists really don't know about the consistency of these various positions with one another. And so in our current societal discourse, when you hear people talking about an oppressed class and an oppressor and making arguments for certain laws or ideas that necessitate that the oppressor becomes less privileged so that the oppressed can gain some kind of benefit in society, that essentially is what we know as cultural Marxism. So what do we do with this idea? What do we think about cultural Marxism? Is this a good thing for society or is it a bad thing for society? Well, in some sense, the basic ideas of cultural Marxism can only come from a Christian worldview and a Christian perspective. Now, that might seem rather odd, and why would I say that? Karl Marx himself was quite critical of Christianity, as were the Frankfurt School. Well, in the pre-Christian world in the West, there wasn't really any kind of status for victims or the oppressed. If you read the works of Roman or Greek literature, you'll see that there really wasn't a care for the oppressed at all. That's not to say that nobody cared for oppressed groups, but there was no broader understanding in terms of societal structure or morality that would give the victim class any kind of status whatsoever. These values really came through the birth of Christianity. Going back to the Old Testament, we see books like the prophet Amos speaking about those who are victims or those who are oppressed and the need and the importance of taking care of those who are victimized and oppressed. And this becomes a value that is very important for the Christian West. And it's something that people care about in the Christian West and should continue to care about. However, what cultural Marxism has done is taken this Christian foundation and then manipulated it and distorted it. While Christians should certainly be caring and considerate of those who are victims, those who are oppressed, and we have an understanding that all people are made in the image of God, whatever their sex, race, class might be, this does not mean that persons themselves must be judged by whatever class they are essentially a part of. For Christianity, this is not some overarching narrative that we can place everybody into one of these categories of either oppressor or oppressed. And this is exactly what you find in modern Marxist and postmodern theory. The interesting thing about this, of course, is now the Christians have become, in the minds of some at least, the oppressive class and therefore on the wrong side. So here now are some of the problems with this Marxist theory. First, it is problematic when people are treated first and foremost by whatever particular group that they are a part of, rather than as the individuals that they are. Now certainly we have an identity in our groups and communities as well as we do individually, but these group identities do not define absolutely everything about us. And this leads to the second problem, which is that a lot of these groupings are really arbitrary. Why is it, for example, that every white person is classified in a particular group because of race, when those white people may be of extremely different economic statuses from very different parts of the world and have completely different life experiences, when there's really nothing that unites them at all other than the fact that they have the same skin color? It's too simplistic to identify and lump people into groups in this way. And there are so many aspects of reality that determine what, what one's privilege is, and that doesn't just have to do with whether it might be a skin color or gender or race. It could be one's attractiveness. It could be one's athletic ability. It could be one's ability to speak with people. Or it could be, you know, one's disabilities, which is why people are now talking about being disabled as another kind of underprivileged group, as well as able-bodied people having privilege. The point is that this list could go on and on and on. There are so many different factors that determine what somebody's privilege and underprivilege might be that you really can't simply classify it in any way at all. A third problem is that this can actually lead to exactly the same power dynamic that these people are pushing against. It is the case that those who are considered to be underprivileged and are fighting against those of privilege, that they then use their own class as a way of gaining an upper hand against those who are considered to be in the privileged class. 
And isn't this really just the same kind of power dynamic they're accusing others of, and now they're using this narrative as a way to put themselves into power? And a final problem is that those with this particular idea seem to think that society is always in this growth or progress, that things are constantly getting better. Society is getting better, and government can and should have more power to be able to enforce these kinds of equality. But in reality, we know that the world is not necessarily getting better. In some ways it is, of course, in terms of technology and healthcare and many other advances in human life. But as Christians, I confess that sin is just a part of reality. It's a part of nature. This is why Marxists are generally opposed to Christianity. A view that says that man is inherently sinful does not really work with an idea that the government must enforce this kind of equality. Because we must confess that though equality is a good, and that we should care for victims and those who are abused and victimized in various different ways, we can't force that to change. We can't force that to stop. Now, as individuals, we can certainly and should help those who are in need in whatever ways that we can. And we can talk and disagree and debate about various government policies. But the notion that we can bring about some kind of utopian, total egalitarian state is simply false. Well, I know that this is a short video and these ideas are probably inadequately explained because there's not enough time to get into details, but this should give you a very basic overview of what people mean when they use the term cultural Marxism. Now, be careful in the way that you use this term. Don't accuse everyone of being a cultural Marxist who ever speaks about victimization or equality, because those things aren't necessarily just tied to cultural Marxism. However, this idea of cultural Marxism is certainly behind a lot of the arguments that people are making in society today. Thanks so much for watching. If you like this video and want to see others like and subscribe, we'll see you next time. God bless.